Hello and welcome to my November 2022 predicted paper. This one's for AQA GCSE Maths Foundation Paper 3. For this first question, we need to round a number to three decimal places. So if we take the number, we go to the third decimal place, that's the one, and draw a line after this. We now check the number after the line, so that's this five here. And if it's a five or greater, then we're going to round up. And since this is a five, we will round up. So the number before the line needs to go up by one. So that one needs to become a two, so it's 3.142. And that's the answer to the question. For the next one, we need to circle a cube number. So to get a cube number, you times a number by itself, and then once more. So one times one times one, which is one. Two times two times two, which is eight. Three times three times three, which is 27. And we see that 27's in the list. So that's the answer. For this question, we have a number line and we need to find the value of a. I noticed that this number line starts at two and it ends at three and it's split into five equal sections. So each section must be 0.2. So it goes two, 2.2, 2.4, 2.6, 2.8, and then 3. So the answer is 2.8. For this question, we need to find the shape that's congruent to the shape of the question. If two shapes are congruent, we say they're identical to each other. So if we take the shape of the question, let's compare it to A, you can see it's not the same. Compare it to C, you can see it's not the same. To D, it's definitely not the same but it is the same shape as B, so the answer is B. For this question, we need to add some symbols to make the statements correct. So they've already done the first one for us. For this next one, we need to remember we've got a calculator, so we can just type negative five times two, which gets you negative 10, and negative five times three, that gives you negative 15. So we need to decide, is negative 10 less than negative 15, greater than negative 15, or the same as negative 15? Well, it's clearly not the same, and if you think of a number line, negative 10 would be more to the right on the number line, closer to zero, therefore it's a greater number. So negative 10 is greater than negative 15. For the last one, if you type this into your calculator, they both give you negative 9, so this one is equals. For this question, we've got Luke who's thinking of two numbers, and we're told one of those numbers is a prime number. So if we write down the prime numbers... And then we're told the second is a multiple of 6. So if we write down the multiples of 6, that's just the 6 times table. And then we find out the sum of the two numbers is 29. So we need to pick two numbers, one of them from the primes, and one of them from the multiples of 6, and it needs to add to make 29. So you could, for instance, pick 5 from the prime numbers, and 24 from the multiples of 6, because 5 add 24 is 29. There are some other possibilities. You could have 11 from the primes, and 18 from the multiples of 6, or you could have 17 from the primes and 12 from the multiples of 6, and you could also have one more, 23 from the primes and 6 from the multiples of 6. For this question we have a number machine, and we're told the output is 29, but we need to work out the input. So for this number machine we're working backwards. When we work backwards for a number machine we need to do the inverse operation. So if we start with 29 and then go backwards, we'll hit this negative 5 here. But when we go through that box, we need to do the opposite of that, so plus 5. Then we go to the times 4 box, we need to do the opposite of times 4, which is divide by 4. So we start with 29, then add 5, that's 34, and then we take that number, 34, and divide it by 4, and that gives you 8.5. And that's the answer to the question. In this question, we're told that the output is a negative number, and we need to work out a possible input. So we just need to try some numbers and make sure we get a negative output. So let's start with negative 20. Negative 20 divided by 10 gives you negative 2, and then take that negative 2 and add 5, and you get 3. So unfortunately, if we choose negative 20, we get 3 as the output, and that's not negative. So it can't be negative 20. Let's make it even more negative. Let's go for negative 60. Negative 60 divided by 10 gives you negative 6, and then if you add 5 to that, you get negative 1. And that is negative. So a possible input would be negative 60. Now there are lots and lots of possible answers for this. In fact, you could have any number as long as it's less than negative 50. So negative 51, negative 52, negative 53, and so on. You could even have negative a million if you wanted. In this question, we need to solve an equation. I'll start by taking away 10 from both sides. 
If you take away 10 from the left hand side then the 10s will cancel so you're just left with 4x. If you take away 10 from the right, 46 take away 10 is 36. Now we can divide both sides by 4, 4x divided by 4 is just x, and 36 divided by 4 is 9, so the answer is x equals 9. In this question we need to work out what Lucy's done wrong, so let's solve the equation properly first. To solve this one take away 4 from both sides, if you take away 4 from the left then the 4s cancel, so you have x over 2, and take away 4 from the right, 10 take away 4 gives you 6. Now we need to deal with this divide by 2, so we multiply 2 on both sides, if you multiply 2 on the left you just get x, and if you multiply by 2 on the right 6 times 2 is 12. So the correct solution is x equals 12. Now let's compare our working out with Lucy's working out to see what mistakes she's made. Now you should be able to spot that Lucy's tried to multiply by 2, because on the right hand side she's gone from 10 to 20, and also that divide by 2 has disappeared. Unfortunately she shouldn't have done this, she should have subtracted 4 first. So you could say, Lucy should have taken away 4 before she multiplied by 2. Now, you are allowed to multiply by 2 first if you do it correctly. For example, if we were to multiply both sides by 2, we would do x over 2 times 2, which is x, but also 4 times 2, and 4 times 2 is 8. Lucy didn't multiply the 4 by the 2. We can continue to solve this just to check it works, 10 times 2 is 20, and now we take away 8 from both sides, that gives you x equals 12, just like we had before. So you could also say that Lucy should have multiplied the plus 4 by the 2. For this question we need to fill in the frequency tree. So we had 18 people that had a vanilla ice cream, and of those 18 people, 15 also had a flake. So to work out the amount that didn't have a flake, we just do 18, take away 15, which is 3. So 3 goes in here. Now we look at those that had the chocolate ice cream, we don't know how many had a chocolate ice cream, but we know that 24 of those had a flake, and 8 of those didn't. So the number of people having a chocolate ice cream must be the total of these, so 24 plus 8, which gets you 32. So 32 goes here. For the second part of the question, we select a student at random, and we need to find the probability that they had a flake with their ice cream. So let's find all of the people that had a flake. So we had these 15 people, and these 24 people. So 15 add 24, gives you 39 people that had a flake. Now to write this as a probability we also need to know the total people that we could select from, so that's everyone that's in this frequency tree, and that's this number 50 here. So as a probability it's 39 over 50. For the first part of this question we need to understand what all of these words mean in terms of angles. So we have an acute angle, that's from 0 to 90 degrees, a right angle is 90 degrees, an obtuse angle is somewhere between 90 and 180, and a reflex angle is from 180 to 360. The angle we've got in the question is 110, so that's an obtuse angle, because it's between 90 and 180. For the second part we need to name the quadrilateral ABDC, now we're told in the question that AC is parallel to BD, and AB is parallel to CD, so we have two pairs of parallel lines, so it must be a parallelogram. For the final part we need to work out the size of angle BDE, that's this angle here. Now since this was a parallelogram, you should know that the opposite angles in a parallelogram are equal, so this 110 degrees here is the same as the angle opposite. So this is also 110. Now in the question we were told that line CDE is a straight line, so we have two angles here on a straight line, therefore they must add up to 180 degrees. So to find the red angle, we just do 180, take away 110, and we get 70 degrees, which is the answer. In this question here we need to put these probabilities in order, from the least likely to the most likely. So if we write them all as decimals, 0 0.3 for game A, that's already a decimal, for game B it's 7 over 20, so in your calculator type 7 divided by 20, and you'll get 0 0.35, and 0 0.07 for game C, that's already a decimal, and to convert a percentage to a decimal you divide it by 100, so 34 divided by 100 is 0 0.34. So now that we've written all of the probabilities as decimals, it becomes easier to compare them. Let's add an extra zero to that first one so they all have the same amount of digits, and now we can make the comparison. So the smallest one is 0.07, and that was for game C, and the next smallest is 0.3, that was for game A, and then it's the bottom one 0.34, and that was game D, and finally the second one 0.35, which was for game B. 
In this question, we have Adam who's making cupcakes. We're told that in five hours he can make 240 of them, and in one week he makes cupcakes for 12 hours. So if he can make 240 in five hours, if we do 240 divided by five, that's at a rate of 48 per hour. So if it's 48 per hour and he's making them for 12 hours, we can do 48 times 12, which is 576. We now need to work out how much profit he makes from these. We're told earlier in the question that it's 15p profit per cupcake, so we do 576 times 15 pence, which gives you 86.4. Now since this is a money question, we need to give it to two decimal places, so 86 pounds 40. For this question, we have a ship that travels a journey in three parts. The first part, it goes from P to Q, then it goes from Q to S, and the final part, the part we're interested in, is from S to P. We need to work out the direction the ship is travelling in part 3, so that's the red part here. Now if you look at the compass points here, we've got north already marked, we can also add on east, west and south. The direction that the ship is travelling is in between the north and the west directions, so it's northwest. For the next part of the question we need to draw a scale diagram of this journey. We've got the scale 1 centimetre represents 2 kilometres. So from P to Q it's 20 kilometres, but every 2 kilometres is represented by 1 centimetre. So 20 divided by 2 gives you 10, so these 20 kilometres would be 10 centimetres on our diagram. And it's the same for the other 20 kilometres. So if we draw two lines, both of length 10 centimetres, and connect these up, we have a finished diagram from P to Q to S. For the first part of this question we need to say what type of correlation is shown. Since the points are going upwards, this is a positive correlation. For the next part, we need to use the graph to estimate the test score of someone who revised for 10 hours. So if we go down and look for 10 hours on the bottom axis, and then go up from this point until you hit the line of best fit, and then go left from this point, we can read off the score. So that score is 36%. In this question, we have two currency conversions. Let's start by looking at pounds to euros. So one pound is 1.16 euros. This means to go from pounds to euros, you multiply by 1.16. To go back from euros to pounds, you divide by 1.16. We've also got the conversion for Croatian kuna into euros. So this one's 0.13. This means to go from Croatian kuna into euros, you multiply by 0.13. And to go backwards from euros to Croatian kuna, you divide by 0.13. So, we need to convert £400 into Croatian kuna. We're going to start by converting the £400 into euros. We said to get from pounds to euros, you multiply by 1.16, so we'll do 400 times 1.16, which gives you 464 euros. We can now use the second conversion to go from euros to Croatian kuna. To go from euros to Croatian kuna, you divide by 0.13. So 464 divide 0.13, gives you this. Now the question asks us to give the answer to the nearest integer, an integer is a whole number, so if we round this off we get 3,569 Croatian kuna. For this question we need to find the hundredth term of the sequence. To do this I'm going to find the nth term first. So the difference between terms is always add 5, so this sequence must be of the form 5n. So I write the 5 times table above the sequence because that's 5n, and then I say how do I get from 5n to our sequence, and in this case it's always add 1, because 5 add 1 is 6, 10 add 1 is 11, 15 add 1 is 16, and so on. So the nth term for this sequence is 5n plus 1. Now we need to find the 100th term of the sequence. To do this we replace the n in the nth term with the number 100. So 5 lots of 100 plus 1. 5 lots of 100 is just 500, so this is 500 plus 1, which is 501. For this question we need to find the modal number of detentions. The modal number is the one with the highest frequency, so the one with the biggest line on the chart. You can see that's this one here. Now the frequency here is 13, but that's not the answer to the mode, that just means there were 13 people that had zero detentions. The mode is the number of detentions, which is zero. For the next part we need to work out the mean. So we need to know how many detentions there were, and divide it by how many people had those detentions. So. If we look at this first bar here, there were 13 people with zero detentions. So that's 13 times zero, which is zero detentions. 
For the next one, there were six people with one detention. So in total, that's six times one, six detentions. For the next one, we had six people with two detentions. So six times two, that's 12 detentions. And the next one, just one person with three detentions. So one times three is three. And the last one, there were four people with four detentions. So four times four is 16. So if we add up all of these numbers, we get 37, which is the total number of detentions. We now need to divide this by how many people there were. Now you could add up all of these numbers here, but you were also told in the question there were 30 students. So that gives you 30, 37 divided by 30 gives you this. The question asked the answer to be to one decimal place, so if we round this off, it's 1.2. For this question we need to draw the graph of y equals 5 minus x. To do that I'm going to create a table of values for x and y, and it tells us the x values in the question, they need to go from negative 1 to 4, so let's put those in the table. Now we substitute each of these x numbers into the formula. So it's y equals 5 minus x. So 5 take away whatever the number for x is. Let's start with x is negative 1. So y equals 5 take away negative 1, which gives you 6. So we put 6 in the table. Then we'll move on to 0, so 5 take away 0, which is 5. So that can go in as well. Then move on to x equals 1, so 5 take away 1, which is 4. And then 5 take away 2, which is 3. 5 take away 3, which is 2. And finally, 5 take away 4, which is 1. Now that we've completed the table, we can plot each of these as a coordinate. So the first coordinate will be negative 1 with 6, which goes here. Then we have 0, 5. Then 1, 4. 2, 3. 3, 2. And 4, 1. Let's connect these up with a straight line. And there's the answer. For the final part of this question, we need to solve an equation. Notice how it starts with 5 minus x, and that matches the graph we just drew. The other side says 2x, and that matches the graph that's been drawn for us. So we're after where these two graphs are equal, which is the crossing point. And we need the x-coordinate because it's an equation in x, so if we go down to the x-axis where they cross, we just read off this value here. It says it wants the answer to one decimal place, so that's about 1.7. For this question, we have a swimming pool that has a capacity of 27,000 litres. We're told that at the start it's empty, and then it's filled by two pumps, and each one of those pumps can add 230 litres of water per minute. We need to show that the pool can be filled in under one hour using those two pumps. So, if we start with the pumps, one of the pumps can pump 230 litres of water per minute, so two of them can pump two times that, so two times 230 is 460 litres per minute. So every minute we can add 460 litres and we need to get to 27,000 litres because that's the capacity of the pool. So if we do 27,000 divide by 460, we find out that it takes 58.6956 and so on minutes. Now we need to show that this can be filled in less than one hour. So if we round the number of minutes we've got here to say 58.7 and one hour is of course 60 minutes, then we could say that 58.7 minutes is less than 60 minutes or one hour. In this question we're told that each of the blocks has the same mass, and we're given their density and volume. So this question is about density, mass and volume. If you rearrange this you get the formula for mass, which is density times volume. So if we look at block A and use this formula we can work out the mass by doing the density, which is 20, multiplied by the volume, which is 4. 20 times 4 is 80, so the mass of block A is 80 grams. Now remember the question said that the mass of each of the blocks is the same. So when we come to do mass B here, 40 times something will get us 80. And if you do 80 divide 40, you get 2. So 40 times 2 is 80. And again, block C has the same mass, so we need two numbers that multiply to make 80. If you do 80 divide by 10, you'll get 8. So the density is 8. For this question, we have a special sequence. After the first two terms, each next term is the sum of the previous two. So this means if we take 6 and A here, the first two terms, if you add those together, you'll get the next one, which is B. Or if you take A and B here, and you add those together, you'll get the next one, 24. Or if you add B and 24, you'll get 39. Now let's work with this one here. B, which is a number we're trying to find, add 24, needs to make 39. 
This means to find b, all we need to do is 39 take away 24, which is 15. So b is 15. Now if we go back to the first one, 6 and a here, if you add those together, must make b. But we know now that b is 15. So 6 add something is 15. So we just do 15 take away 6, which is 9. So a is 9. So the sequence, which you didn't need to write down, is 6, 9, 15, 24, 39. Now that sequence will be useful for the second part of this question though. We need to decide if the number 3001 is in the sequence or not. So you could continue to add these numbers together and see what you get when you get to near 3000. However, there is a better way. Notice that all of these numbers are multiples of 3. They're all in the 3 times table. Now if you add together two numbers in the 3 times table, your answer will also be in the 3 times table. So this whole sequence will be multiples of 3. 3001 is not a multiple of 3, because 3000 is, but adding 1 to it makes it 1 bigger. So, we could explain this by saying, all of the terms in the sequence are multiples of 3. 3001 is not a multiple of 3, so our answer is no, it's not in the sequence. For the first part of this question, we need to find the relative frequency of correct answers for year 7. So if we look at the year 7 ones here, we've got 12 correct and 18 incorrect. So for the relative frequency of correct answers, we do how many we had, which was 12, divide by the total answers. So 12 add 18, which is 30. You do 12 divided by 30 on your calculator and you'll get 0 0.4. So the relative frequency is 0 0.4. For the second part of the question, we have 60 year 11 students who also did the maths problem. And we know the relative frequency for year 11 is the same as the relative frequency for year nine. Now we're told the relative frequency for year nine, it's in the table here, 0 0.25. So, whatever we get for year 11, it must come out as 0.25. If we were to do the relative frequency for year 11, we do the number of correct answers, which we don't know yet, so let's call it C, divide by the total answers, now we know there were 60 year 11 students, so that's 60, and this needs to come out as 0.25. So we just have an equation to solve. If you multiply both sides of this by 60, you'll get C on the left, and 60 times 0.25 is 15. So the answer is 15. In this question, we need to enlarge a triangle by scale factor 3 about the point 1, 1. So the first thing to do is mark on the point 1, 1. This is our center of enlargement. Now I'm going to pick a point on the shape. I'm going to go for this top one here, and I've marked it off so we can see it in blue. We need to consider how we get from the center of enlargement, which is the red one, to our point in blue. So I could do that by going two squares to the right and three squares up. Now, that represents a scale factor 1 journey, I need to do the scale factor 3, so I'm going to repeat that journey two more times. So 2 to the right, 3 up. Now that's scale factor 2, so one more time, 2 to the right, 3 up. Now that I've done this journey three times in total, that must be scale factor 3. So the blue cross represents where it would transform to at the top here. Now, let's pick a different point on the shape, let's do this one here, and I've marked this one in green. So how do we get from the center of enlargement, that's the red one, to the green one? We'd go two right and two up. We've done that journey once, we need to do it three times. So two right, two up, two right, two up, and this is where the green cross would go. And finally, the last point on the shape, I've marked this one in pink. So starting at the red cross, we go four to the right, two up. That's once, so do it again, four to the right, two up. And one more time, four to the right, two up, the pink cross would go here. If we now join up this shape, we've got a triangle in large scale factor 3. In this question, we have been told the area of the triangle ABE is 40 centimeters squared. So that's this triangle here. To work out the area of a triangle, you do 1 half times the base, which in this case you can see is 8, times the height, but we don't know the height, so let's call it H. But we know the answer, we know it gets you 40. So half of 8 is 4, so we can just replace this with 4 times h, and 4 times h is 4h. So if 4h equals 40, divide both sides by 4, 1h equals 10. So we know the height of the triangle is 10. Now, that's also the height of the trapezium, and we need to find the area of trapezium a, b, c, d. So that's the whole trapezium. We have a formula for this, it's 1 half a plus b h where a and b are the parallel sides and h is the height. So we've got one half, a plus b, so they're the parallel sides, let's use 14 at the top, 
And the bottom one, you need to be careful, it's this whole length here, which is 20 plus 8, 28, and we times this by the height, which is 10. If you type all of this as it is into your calculator, you'll end up with the answer 210. For this question, we have a sector, and we need to work out the length of the arc AB. That's this arc here. To do this, we're going to find the angle of the sector, which is this one here. This angle, plus 160, makes a full turn, which would be 360. So to find the blue angle here, we do 360 take away 160, which is 200. So this angle in here is 200 degrees. Now we can use the formula for the arc length, which is the angle, 200, divide by 360, times pi, times diameter. Now we need to work out the diameter of this sector. The radius here is marked on is 8 centimeters. The diameter would be double that, so 2 eighths, which is 16. You can now just type this into your calculator, and you'll get this. The question asks us to round it to three significant figures though, so if we round this off we get 27.9. For this question we have a triangle with some angles marked and we need to find the value of x. Now you should know that the angles in the triangle add up to make 180 degrees, so let's add up all of these angles. We've got 2x minus 1, add 6x, add the final angle, which is x plus 10. And this must make 180 because it's a triangle. Now if we collect some like terms, we've got 2x, 6x and x. 2 add 6 makes 8, add 1 more makes 9, so that's 9x. And then we've got negative 1 plus 10, which is positive 9. So 9x plus 9 must equal 180. We can now just solve this, take away 9 from both sides. Take away 9 from the left, you get 9x. Take away 9 from the right, 171. And then divide both sides by 9. 9x divide 9 is x. And 171 divided by 9 gives you 19. So x is 19. In this question, we're told that Joe's dog runs at an average speed of 10 meters per second. We're also told the ratio of Joe's dog's average speed to Joe's average speed is 4 to 1. So let's write out that ratio. We've got Joe's dog speed to Joe's speed in the ratio 4 to 1. Now we're told Joe's dog speed, that's 10, so let's write that underneath the 4. And we need to know how do we get from 4 to 10? What do we multiply by? So if you use your calculator and do 10 divided by 4, you'll find that's 2.5. So if we multiply by 2.5 on the other side, 1 times 2.5 is just 2.5. So Joe's speed is 2.5 meters per second. Now the question wants us to do how long it takes Joe to run 400 meters. So we need to use a formula, speed equals distance divided by time. We're trying to find the time, so we do time equals distance divided by speed. So Joe's distance, which is going to be 400 meters, divided by Joe's speed, which we found out in the ratio was 2.5. Type this into your calculator and you'll get the time. This comes out at 160, so it's 160 seconds. In this question, we're told that point B lies on the line x equals 9. That's a vertical line that goes through 9 on the x-axis like this. So B is somewhere on this line. We're also told that the gradient of the line AB is 1 half. The gradient could be thought of as the change in y divided by the change in x, and that's going to be equal to 1 half. Now, you could interpret this by saying this 2 here on the bottom is going to be a change in x, and the 1 on the top here is a change in y. So, if I make two positive movements in the x direction, I make one positive movement in the y direction. So if I start at a, and do two positive movements in the x direction, I do one in the y direction. And then I can just repeat this, two in the x direction, one in the y direction, two in the x direction, one in the y direction, two in the x, and one in the y. So since b must lie on this blue line, we found it, it's here, and the line ab joins up like so. We're asked for the coordinates of b, so that's going to be 9 and 5. In this question, we're told that a is equal to 3 eighths of c. So 3 eighths of c is equal to a. We're also told in the question, though, the value of a. It just says a is 24, so we can replace this a with 24. So 3 eighths of c is 24. This could be written as 3 eighths times c equals 24. We can solve this equation, multiply both sides by 8 first. If you multiply the left by 8, you'll get 3c, and if you multiply 24 by 8, you get 192. Now divide both sides by 3, you get c on the left, and 192 divided by 3 is 64. So c is 64. 
Now, we're told the mean of A, B and C is 40. So we have three numbers where the mean is 40. So we add them up and get a total and divide that by three and we end up with 40. So if we do 40 times three, we get 120, which means they need to add up to make 120. Since we now know two of the numbers, we know A and C, we can add them together. 24 add 64 is 88. So B must be the remaining amount to get to 120. So 120, take away 88, gets you 32. So B is 32. Thank you for watching this video, I hope you found it useful. Once again, there are some suggested grey boundaries here based on what they were in the summer. Check out the video I think you should watch next and subscribe so you don't miss out on future videos.